probably have some from the community health program that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we have an alum back there. It looks like Brendan. I haven't seen him in a while. Who does health work? I was thinking you look familiar. Welcome back. Um, so, uh, I think I'm on camera. You're on camera. You can talk later. <laughs> All right, I think we are ready to start the introduction. It is noon. Uh, welcome everyone to the Friday Transportation Seminar. Uh, I'm Jennifer Dill, Professor of Urban Studies and Planning here at Portland State University and Director of TREC, the Transportation Research and Education Center at PSU, uh, which houses NITSI. Uh, the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, and NITSI. Uh, today we have one of our uh, NITSI visiting scholars with us for the Friday uh, seminar. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Brian Salins. He's a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington. He's also a principal investigator at Seattle Children's Research Institute. Um, he is a clinical health psychologist, and his interest areas include obesity treatment and prevention, especially in environmental factors and policies that influence physical activity and eating behaviors in children and adults. Uh, and we are very excited to have him here today to talk about some research that he's been doing up in the Seattle um, area related to transit and physical activity. We're going to hold uh, questions to the end. Those of you who may be new to joining us, um, we do, the reason I'm holding this microphone, but it doesn't sound like my voice is any louder than normal, um, we do webcast the seminars. So there are people watching live on the web and it is archived. Uh, when we get to the point to ask questions, that microphone up there will pick up your voice, but please speak clearly and loudly. Um, and also, if you're in the class and you're answering a question, I'll remind you, asking a question, I'll remind you to state your name at the beginning. So I'll turn it over to you, Great. Brian. Thanks very much. And Jennifer, thanks for the invitation. And uh, uh, I'm more than happy to come down to Portland anytime uh, folks are willing to have me. If nothing else, then just run along the uh, river. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do while I'm here. Um, although yesterday I got here and I was blamed for the rain, um, which seems incongruent with uh, your usual uh, weather pattern. Um, I was encouraged to talk a little bit about my journey of how I got to uh, study public transportation and why I, I would be interested in that as a, as a health psychologist. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I, I do have a degree in health psychology. I'm a card-carrying member of the American Psychological Association. Um, strange that I got perhaps to public transportation, but I'll explain why. Um, and um, I think one of the reasons is um, there's a focus on health behavior change um, within health psychology. Um, and there's been a long history within health psychology and I would say public health in general in trying to understand individual level factors. Um, examples, things like gender, self-efficacy, things that are internal to us that we think drive health behaviors. Um, and I would argue that uh, we need to spend less time focused on those individual level factors and more time focused on environmental factors and infrastructure, things like transportation. I had the good fortune as a, uh, a postdoctoral fellow to get fabulous mentoring and an exposure to uh, urban planning and transportation um, and really helped me um, kind of adopt a paradigm shift in how I think about physical activity. Um, and hopefully you'll hear that as, as I present um, some of the data that we've been working on. Um, it wasn't very far into an understanding of planning and transportation that I realized you guys are looking at the same outcomes perhaps as we are um, and you're doing it better than we are um, because you have spatial data and you have spatial methodologies that you bring to it. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm still a researcher um, in, in practice. Um, I've shifted a little bit of my work to being a little bit of a practitioner um, and in fact do a lot of collaboration with our public health department um, and we give a fair amount of money um, through federal grants to jurisdictions to do transportation planning um, and to do uh, land use planning. Um, so an interesting part of my job. Um, and so a researcher with a little bit of knowledge plus a part-time practitioner, which I think could be quite uh, dangerous, but hopefully helpful. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about the rationale for why focus on public transportation. 
um, within uh, physical activity. Why would someone in physical activity be interested in public transportation? Um, review some of the evidence for the link between public transport and physical activity. Um, and I say here with increasing confidence, I think we're getting closer and closer um, to a good solid evidence base um, about those relationships. Um, and I'll focus on transit-specific physical activity, focus on studies that looked at transit users versus non-transit users in evaluating overall physical activity. And finally, I'll end with what we've done recently, which is looking at the same people and looking at their transit use over time um, and uh, device-based transit-specific physical activity measures. I'll talk a little bit about the natural experiments we're doing around public transportation and then suggest perhaps some future work. Um, these are a list, and, and a little bit of, of a dated list, though, of risk factors that are related to death in the U.S. Um, and what are those number one risk factors? Um, one of them is tobacco smoking. Still continues to be a high reason why people are dying and dying prematurely in the U.S. Um, then we get into things that are related to physical activity. High blood pressure, overweight obesity, actual physical activity independent of those things, high blood glucose, and it goes down from there. Um, one of the things I like to point out to my infectious disease control folks is that Ebola and other infectious diseases are nowhere close to this list because they don't kill thousands of people, um, at least in the U.S. Um, so these are the reasons why people are dying prematurely. And also, if I put up the reasons for why people are ill, um, particularly in older adulthood, it would be a very similar list. Um, it has to do with the health behaviors they engage in or don't engage in um, that are contributing to premature uh, mortality and significant morbidity. Um, so why focus on physical activity? You know, why is that such a highly prevalent risk factor for disease? Um, these are rates um, from uh, mid-2005, uh, 2006, as well as 2007, 2008. The things in gold um, are the prevalence of adults meeting criteria for recommended levels of physical activity. Um, and the current recommendation for adults is to get at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day. The things in gold are based on their self-report, how much folks are telling us how much activity they're getting throughout their day. Um, and about 60 to six, about 60 percent of the adult population reports getting that level of, of at least moderate uh, intensity physical activity. Um, now, when you stick accelerometers on folks, um, and the red bars are from NHANES. NHANES is a nationally representative uh, health sample, um, kind of demographically and uh, economically representative of the U.S. You get much lower rates of actually people meeting recommendations. Um, and in fact, in Haines, in, in these data, used you have to have at least 10-minute bouts of activity for it to count towards moderate to vigorous. Um, and if you do that, less than 10% of our adult population are actually meeting those criteria. So perhaps not surprising um, that this important health behavior is contributing to premature uh, death and morbidity. Not a lot of folks are doing it. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, I didn't actually include kids. Um, uh, Kids are meeting recommendations. Um, adolescents are less likely to meet recommendations, and that just kind of plummets um, in early adulthood and stays there um, throughout. So what are opportunities uh, for physical activity? So we have a very low rate of people meeting recommendations. We have significant mortality and morbidity associated with being inactive and being overweight. Um, so what are opportunities for it? Um, perhaps one opportunity um, is at your job. Um, and so uh, this is a publication in 2011 um, where folks looked at um, the metabolic equivalence of different job types um, and the percentage of jobs in the U.S. Um, that actually were, were being physically active or not. Um, so a MET is a metabolic equivalent, essentially kilocalories per kilogram per hour that you're burning doing an activity. Um, however, um, jobs that were moderately active about 50% of, of jobs in 1960 included moderate physical activity in them. Um, by 2010, it was about 20%. Um, and the rates of jobs that were sedentary or very light physical activity, um, including my job. Um, I could spend most of my job sitting. Um, if I didn't actually stand up from my desk, I work at a computer most of the day. I assume most of you spend most of your time working at computers as well. Um, and when you do that, you see this precipitous drop off um, over the past 50 years and the amount of physical activity folks are getting from their jobs. Um, we don't see a lot of active jobs on the horizon either. Uh, it's not like we're going to increase substantial manual labor. Um, this is probably going to continue to drop um, as we get more te technologically advanced. So the job is probably not the place where we're going to actually increase folks' physical activity. What about your home? 
I mean, maybe your home is a place where you can um, invest resources to actually encourage uh, your family members to be more active. Um, this is from a study where we, um, and I'll explain the, the method of, these, of this study a little bit more in detail later, where we had information about where people were throughout their day. Um, we had accelerometers on them so we could link where they were to the accelerometry um, and figure out how much, of the place, how much of the time they were in different places they were active. Um, and we found that um, people spend about 51% of their waking hours in their home or nearby their home, within 125 meters of it. Um, however, only about 4% of that time was actually physical activity. The rest of it was quite sedentary. And this actually doesn't include sleep time. If we included sleep, we would you know, reduce this probably to like 2% or less than 1% uh, of the time actually spent near or around your home um, meets the level of, of being physically active. Um, you know, I argue a little bit about this. I've got three young children. My level is probably 5%, uh, not 4%, um, but it's still pretty sedentary um, throughout uh, my home. My kids aren't sedentary, but I'm more sedentary than they are. All right, well, what about programs, right? So for the longest time, public health folks and physical activity folks have been pushing programmatic interventions to try to get people to be more active, going to the gym, uh, doing calisthenics, uh, going swimming. Um, unfortunately, um, a recent uh, meta-analysis found that these programs, um, and not surprisingly, um, programs amongst healthy adults increase physical activity only about two minutes on average per day. Uh, two minutes on average isn't going to get me to 30 very quickly. Um, I have to go to 15 programs throughout my day in order to get to 30 minutes. Um, unfortunately, it also only targets people who are already interested in being active, right? Um, there's very poor maintenance of these effects over time. Once the intervention or program stops, it's not like people sustain their activity in other uh, environments or contexts. Programs require ongoing funding to often uh, make them available, and oftentimes there are costs to them. Um, so they're only for people who have the time, money, motivation to actually be active. Um, I went to the gym this morning, um, and there are very active people there. They're further motivated. They're further interested. They're the folks that have the resources to be able to actually engage in this um, in order to be active. So um, it's not going to be my job. It's not going to be home. It's not going to be programmatic. And in addition, um, these risks, and I didn't present this before for the whole nation, this is our county. Um, and these are the rates of obesity, with darker shades being higher rates of obesity, lighter shades being lighter, shade, lighter um, rates of obesity. Um, the risk of inactivity, obesity, and all the other consequences related to it are not equitable. Right? They're not geographically distributed throughout places. Um, they're oftentimes very concentrated in places in ways that these folks, and if folks are familiar, this is Seattle, um, this is kind of the Delridge area, SeaTac, Tukwila, uh, Auburn, uh, Renton, these are our southern uh, jurisdictions in our county, um, where we have much higher rates of low-income folks and much more ethnic and cultural diversity. Um, so um, if we want to have a population impact on health, we have to be able to make sure that those folks are getting adequate opportunities to be active. And the programmatic stuff is likely not going to do it. Um, all right, so I've presented all the dismal stuff. Uh, and, and barriers and, and, and reasons why people may not be active. Let's start to talk about uh, optimism, um, about how we can get people to be, potentially how do we get more people to be active and where they're actually being active throughout their day. Um, in the study I talked about before, we have um, accelerometry data and we know where people are located um, based on GPS data, where we actually were able to stitch together location with physical activity. Um, we also were able to generate from that data uh, the type of physical activity that folks were doing. Um, so accelerometers are great because they give us a much more objective measure of movement, but they don't tell us what type of physical activity folks are doing. They just give us a measure of acceleration. And so they give us a measure of intensity of physical activity. So in this study, this is called our track study, um, folks wore an accelerometer and a GPS device. Um, and we wanted to see how much walking folks were getting as a result of, of, of engaging in seven days of, of wearing these devices. Um, this is the self-report, um, not from this sample, but from the U.S. sample as a whole. So on, the, on average, um, U.S. adults report about 28% of their uh, physical activity as walking, about 22% is some other moderate activity, and about 50% of it is vigorous. So vigorous meaning you know, at least six, seven mats, running, I guess vigorous dancing, cross-country skiing, those types of things. Um, you shouldn't have a lot of faith in those data. Um, when we actually use the kind of objective data, 
we're able to integrate objective data with other subjective data as well. We find out it's actually, a, we found in our sample, not representative of the U.S., but in our sample about 58 to 59 percent of the activity was walking behavior. Now, about 37 percent of it was other moderate, and about 1 percent of it was actually vigorous. I and mean, I can tell you that 1 percent is driven by about 10 percent of our sample doing any vigorous, and the rest of our sample doing no vigorous activity at all. Um, in some ways, th this to me is more hopeful um, in terms of trying to impact physical activity because it's very hard to get people to be vigorously active, right? And if they're reporting their, about 50% of their activity is vigorous, it's going to be even more difficult to get them to be more vigorous than that. Um, when you look at our sample, this actually replicates what Europeans say they get in terms of physical activity. So Europeans are much more honest, probably, regarding the... Or they haven't heard the public health message in the U.S. that you should be vigorously active, right? So what we're getting from people in self-report is likely what we're telling them to do, um, not actually what they're doing. So walking, an opportunity perhaps to get people to be more active and to meet that recommendation for physical activity. As I pointed out, we were able to look at location. And so we were able to look at location and type of activity within our track study. And we defined home um, as 125 meters around their home, um, so in their home parcel as well as around it. Um, their neighborhood is up to 1.6 uh, kilometers around their home. We define that as neighborhood. We can have lots of discussions about how you define neighborhood. Um, and then far from home, beyond that radius. And what did we find? So there's that home data I presented. Um, 51% of the time was spent at home. About 12% of the time was spent in that neighborhood, so that 1.6 kilometer buffer around their home. Um, and about 37% of their time was far away from home. Now that's not very interesting. The interesting part is when they're in their neighborhood, they're doing much more physical activity um, than they are at home. So about 34% of the time they spend in their neighborhood was meeting the level of uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, and they're far away from home was a little bit less time. This probably, we didn't break out work, this probably is associated with work. So they're far away from home, uh, at work, being sedentary. All right, so we've got walking, neighborhood. Um, we know that uh, people actually are willing to walk in their neighborhood if things are close to them. Right, so this is an infographic based on the 2009 National Household Travel Survey. Um, and we find that you look at different uh, land uses uh, in neighborhoods, if they're proximal, people are much more willing to walk to them. About 46% of people, if a church or school is within a mile of that, they're walking. Um, shops, businesses, uh, employment, um, trips to social or recreational fund by walking. Again, much higher percentages of walking if it's proximal. Makes sense. What this slide doesn't include, though, is public transportation. Right? So these are destinations that are close by, that are terminal destinations. Um, but I would argue that we actually should t start talking much more about public transportation as a way to um, understand more about physical activity. So why focus on physical activity in relation to public transportation? Most trips, a lot of trips that you take, are certainly beyond a mile or a half mile from where you're willing to go. And the likelihood that you're going to walk to those destinations is close to none. Right? So I live seven miles from my house. I would love to walk to work every single day. I do not have the two hours it would take me to get um, to work um, by walking or, or jogging there. Um, we think um, that public transportation often involves a, at least one or two uh, walking trips to get to and from that um, access. Unlike programmatic interventions, there are other ways we're trying to encourage people to be active. Um, walking to and from transportation might be a stealth form of physical activity that people don't perceive as physical activity, so they may not compensate by being less active at other parts of the day, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we think that public transportation might actually address equity issues much better than programmatic or other interventions. Um, and again, it may not be perceived as physical activity. Um, so I swiped this from a, a recent article um, to highlight how we, we're starting to think about how transit might be related to um, physical activity. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, you'll see in orange, that is the origin, whether it's home or some other origin, to the nearest transit stop. Oftentimes, at least in a U.S. context, you have to get to that transit stop, and oftentimes it's, it's walking behavior. Um, then we have a bunch of transit and transit transfers in the middle, and at the end, um, going from that transit stop to the destination perhaps could include more walking. Um, so whereas transportation folks are oftentimes very interested in this stuff in the middle, um, we're interested in the stuff that happens before and after transit trips um, to see whether that could be a contribution to 
physical activity. So we have a bunch of different design options to try to understand the relationship between transit and physical activity. Um, and I want to go through a bunch of, of studies that have used these design options um, and to talk a little bit about the threat to the conclusions of them. Um, and let me talk about uh, what those threats might be. Um, so the first set of studies I'm going to talk about has to do with, well, how much activity is related to specific transit behavior? So if you were to, to uh, you know, sample and do intercept surveys at transit stops, um, you can get an estimate of how much um, and how often people are walking to and from transit to try to get a very specific estimate of how much, on average, people get uh, in terms of physical activity to and from transit. Um, you can compare users and non-users and see whether your users get more physical activity as a whole than your non-users. Um, however, those two designs suffer from two things. Um, one is the potential for self-selection bias. Right? So transit isn't also randomly distributed throughout your uh, geographic area. Um, it's in certain locations. It co-occurs with other locations, with other things in those locations. And it could be that, well, if I'm a transit user, I'm also perhaps selecting my neighborhood for other characteristics that are associated with transit use that also make me more physically active. Right? So and you have the potential of... of misinforming whether increasing transit service or changing transit infrastructure would impact physical activity without better understanding what that third variable confounding could be. Um, the other problem is if you just look at transit users and non-transit users, you don't know um, whether the transit use is driving that behavior and or whether there's substitution um, for transit behavior on other days um, in physical activity. And again, I'll talk more about um, how we're trying, to, we're trying to address those threats, the conclusions that transit might be driving physical activity. So let's start with the um, estimated amount of walking or physical activity that folks think is, be is believed related to transit behavior throughout their day. So this is a study from Besser in 2005. They used NHTS uh, 2001 data. Um, and they estimated how much walking was related to transit use on a day base, on a day-to-day -day basis. And they found in bus and rail, about 23 to 24 minutes of walking behavior was associated with transit use. Um, and here is where they, um, they address some of the issues of, of equity or uh, inequity. Um, higher rates of walking behavior amongst fo folks with lower education levels. Um, they found the same thing for income. Um, so folks with lower income, lower education, were actually walking farther spending more time walking to and from transit, um, perhaps doing more transfers within transit that are contributing to more walking behavior. So again, if you looked at uh, more recent data, it's actually a very similar group of authors that looked at the 2009 data and found a very similar thing. Um, about 29 minutes of walking was directly related to transit, um, or at least on the days that folks were taking transit. Um, and that varied from zero to four minutes up to greater than 95 minutes of walking related to transit. Those folks are really walking um, a lot, getting a lot of activity as a result of taking transit. Um, but the median was about 20 minutes, um, you know, somewhere in here. Um, so a fair amount of physical activity. And when you think about 20 minutes, that's 10 times what you're getting from programmatic interventions on a daily basis. It's quite a substantial amount going towards that 30 minutes of, of moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, on a given day. Um, this is a study from uh, Montreal um, where they actually had travel data from, I believe, over 169,000 um, respondents um, for one-day travel logs. Um, and they didn't actually look at amount of time, but they get looked at distance uh, that people were walking and then simulated that um, using, I think, about, about 3.4, 3.6 mile per hour uh, walking speed. And they estimated different levels of walking time associated with different uses of different types of uh, public transportation, ranging from um, city bus, which was a little bit lower, to commuter train, where folks were getting the recommended level of physical activity independent of other behaviors um, by just taking commuter train on a daily basis. Um, other folks have looked at um, specifically light rail transit to see whether there's um, folks are walking to and from that and what kind of distances or amount of time they're spending. Um, being active as a result of going to and from transit, ranging from uh, you know, an average of a quarter mile up to more than a half mile that people were taking to get an access to and from transit. Um, now again, this, the nice thing about uh, transit behavior and walking is that's only one of those trips. Um, and oftentimes people are taking four trips if they're taking transit throughout the day. So if you commute to work by transit, you're walking from your home to a transit stop, taking transit, working from that transit stop the terminal transit stop to your workplace and then back again, right? So that's four trips. If you accumulate that throughout the day, you're getting very close to the recommended level of physical activity. All right. So 
we think that there's, there's um, at least in areas where there isn't a lot of park and rides, um, about 15 to 20 minutes of physical activity that, that uh, we can ascribe to transit use. Um, but does that translate to more physical activity for transit users or not? Um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of studies that have actually tried to examine that. This is a study back, uh, that Leonard uh, published back in 2007 um, where they were interested to look um, at people that were commuting from New Jersey to New York City. Um, and they had a sample of folks that commuted by train and of folks that commuted by car, very demographically similar. similar. They actually had them wear pedometers for, I believe it was seven days, could have been up to ten days. Um, and they found significant difference between folks that were taking train and car. Um, so their transit, and again, we don't know whether it's specific to their transit use, but our, transit, our train users were getting much more activity than um, our car users. Um, we did a very similar thing um, with our study, but instead of just looking at uh, uh, one area, we looked at a bunch of different areas um, to see whether built environment interacted um, with transit use to uh, relate to physical activity. So let me walk you through this slide. Um, in the left-hand side, these are unadjusted uh, for any kind of demographic variables or built environment variables. Um, and we see um, that folks that were infrequent transit users, less than 50% of their commute to work trips were by transit, um, versus frequent transit users, where more than 50% of their work trips were um, by transit, had much higher overall physical activity than folks that weren't transit users at all. Um, and it was about five, or set, five to seven minutes per day. Again, the frequent transit users, even those uh, folks, didn't take transit every day. Um, and these were um, accelerometry based on seven days. So it included weekend days. Um, and so that's why this estimate is slightly lower than the amount of time we think is related to their specific transit use. When we broke out our sample into folks that were lived in high walkable neighborhoods versus low walkable, that's the built environment, um, we found transit still was driving a higher level of physical activity. Um, even after adjusting for demographic variables as well. Um, it was actually even higher in our low built environment areas than in our high built environment, uh, our high physical activity, sorry, our high walkability environments. So we find that transit users were getting more activity overall than non-transit users, regardless of where they lived. Um, recent evidence review um, found about 27 studies that looked at the link between physical activity and transit. Um, and they found between 8 to 33 minutes of physical activity was associated with public transit. Um, and most studies found it was that 12 to 15 minutes per day. Um, about 10 to 29 percent of, of the study's populations who were transit users actually met that 30-minute recommendation just by taking transit. They didn't do any other activity throughout their day in order to meet that recommendation. Um, and a good proportion of them were meeting the recommendation just because of their public transportation use. Finally, getting to the methods I've been talking about. This is from a, a study, and I'll, I'll present some of the longitudinal findings of, about this study, but this is from, uh, this is the methodology that we used in our track sample. Um, we had about 700 respondents, um, adult respondents, who wore accelerometer, GPS, and filled out a travel diary for us for a seven-day period. This is back in 2008, 2009. We did this for a couple of reasons. One, we did want to understand the context in which physical activity was happening. Two, we wanted to better characterize what type of physical activity folks were doing. Um, and we relied on the fact that all these things have timestamps, right? So accelerometry, the way we set up our accelerometer, it collected data every 30 seconds about the intensity of activity that folks were doing. Um, and so a continuous feed of, of data about physical activity. Um, we had a GPS we also set at a 30-second epoch to collect data on location, speed, altitude, um, other variables that we get from GPS. And then the travel diary gives us a sense of, of what type of, of mode they were engaged in, what location they were going to, um, what activity they were doing at those locations. We combine those into what uh, our colleagues call life logs, um, so your life log, um, and then we use those in analysis. So when you do GPS on folks in, in the Seattle area, this is what you get, this big blob uh, of GPS traces. These are all the GPS traces from the 700 respondents we have. Um, so you guys have a lot of bridges. We've got two major bridges. We've got a bunch of ferries, though, people taking ferries across the water. That's what they're doing. Um, or they're aberrant GPS points where they hop off and then hop back on the land. Um, but what do we do with that GPS data um, and the accelerometry data? Um, and this is from a study we uh, published last year. Um, and I want to walk through each of these examples. Again, we wanted to identify whether it was walking behavior 
um, because one of the aims of the study was to understand whether light rail changes the amount of walking behavior people are engaged in. Um, so in this top left-hand corner, um, in this uh, purple, um, is the GPS speed. Um, in the blue is our accelerometry data. And on the top bar is where people were reporting in their travel log they were or what trips they were taking. So in this example, um, this responded, oops, I lost my cursor. Back. There it is. This respondent said they were home. Um, the, the accelerometer suggested that they were actually engaged in a physical activity bout. We defined physical activity of at least lasting five minutes with up to two minute breaks in them. Um, and um, the GPS in the purple suggested they were actually moving at a speed consistent with walking. So they missed this trip. This is a trip they took out from their home. They went somewhere in their neighborhood. They came back to their home. They reported they were at home, but in fact, they were actually uh, walking in their neighborhood. Um, and the GPS and accelerometry suggested that was true. Um, in this uh, second example, we lost the GPS. Right? For some reason, we didn't have GPS data. Um, either they were walking uh, or outside, or they were uh, in their house, or some other reason uh, we, we did not have GPS data for this particular bout. And my cursor isn't walking consistently, so I'm going to actually use the pointer. Um, and um, they said they were home, but actually they reported a walking bout. The accelerometer suggested they had a walking bout, so we considered that walking as well. So we didn't have GPS data, but we had information from the travel diary that suggested that they were actually walking, um, and the accelerometer suggested they were walking as well. Here, um, there was no GPS data, but the accelerometry suggested there was a bout, um, and they were um, on the bus, or at least they reported being on the bus. Um, this we ascribed to being a transit-related physical activity bout, um, and it was actually um, in, at an accelerometry level consistent with walking. Um, so again, we went through all of our GPS, accelerometry, uh, travel diary data to try to get a sense of whether people were engaged in walking or non-walking, and where, in fact, that was actually happening. Just a schematic of what we did to try to extract transit-related walking. Um, so unlike the prior studies that looked at just having accelerometry overall, um, we have accelerometry to give us an overall measure of folks' physical activity, but then we can break it out um, into activity that happens um, independent of transit or activity that happens within a, a buffer around when a transit trip actually happened. So what happens when we, get, when we do that, when we break out those data? We did a very similar analysis to what folks had done before. We looked at transit use and overall physical activity. And we found that our transit users, um, our low transit users, our medium transit users, and our high transit users, all were overall more physically active than our non-transit users. Um, and when you looked at their non-walking behavior, however, it was almost exactly the same. So the stuff in yellow is stuff that's not walking. Um, it's other moderate or vigorous physical activity that they were doing. No difference between um, transit users, non-transit users, between low transit users and high transit users. When we looked at their non-transit related walking, they were also very similar, similar level of other walking behavior that hadn't, didn't have to do with transit. What was, what was adding to the higher levels of physical activity amongst our high transit users was that transit related walking, stuff that happened either overlapping or within 10 minutes of a transit trip. Um, and it was about 15 minutes on average, even on their, and that's average across transit and non-transit days. I'll get the questions. All right. So we replicated what other folks had found. We suggest that it might be related to walking, um, and particularly transit-related walking. But then we broke up the data into a different way to feel even more confident that it actually was transit-related, and there wasn't a substitution happening here. So same study, same data. Um, these are our non-transit users. They got a bunch of, of walking in. This is walking. This is physical activity that's not walking. The zero is they didn't get any transit behavior transit-related physical activity, right? They're non-transit users. We broke up our transit users, though, into their non-transit days and their transit days. Because even if you're a transit user, and I'm a transit user, I take transit probably about two days a week. Um, and there are, and you can, we can look at, because we have time and stamp, time stamp data, on the days I take transit, am I getting more activity versus the days where I don't take transit? Um, and in fact, Transit users on non-transit days look exactly like non-transit users. You're getting the same amount of, of physical activity. Um, they're getting the same, very similar amount of walking behavior, very similar amount of non-walking physical activity. But when you look on their transit days, they're adding about 15 minutes of physical activity, and nearly all of it 
is related to transit use. Um, they're not substituting on these days for that 15 extra minutes of transit behavior, um, and they're not, these folks are not reducing their non-walking behavior and or their other walking on the days where they're getting in this transit-related um, physical activity. All right. Um, I've got about five or six more minutes. I've got to cruise through some things. All right. Um, so our current work, I'm going to describe two studies that we have um, currently ongoing. Um, and we, we hope that these studies start to better address whether changes in tr transit infrastructure um, relate to changes in, in physical activity. Um, because the reality is that's what our policymakers want to know. Right? They appreciate the distinction between cross-sectional studies that I've just described. And, well, you know, Dr. Sandler, does that mean if we change transit uh, service or change transit infrastructure that people are going to be more active and we'll get a public health benefit as a result of that? Um, so one study I alluded to before is our track project. This is a study we started back in 2008. Um, we call this a natural experiment in which an environment is changing substantially. You folks have had light rail for a very long time. We've only had it for four, five years now. Um, and we only have one line, a single line that goes from our airport uh, to our downtown area, but passes through a residential area. Um, one of the greatest things about, um, at least from an experimental design perspective, natural experiments is we address some of the concerns about residential self-selection. So in this sample, um, we're trying to understand more about the impact of light rail on walking. Um, but our cases are adults that live within one mile um, of our, our future transit stations. Um, and our controls are adults that are similar demographically um, and in terms of their baseline built environment, but they live farther than a mile but within our county. Um, so a case control study. Um, in this study, we got some uh, attitudinal psychosocial survey data. Um, as I described before, we got seven data of accelerometry, GPS, and travel logs. Um, we had about 700 participants at baseline, um, and three or four years later, we're still analyzing this data. We still have over 500 of the same participants. So this is a longitudinal cohort study, not a, cross, a serial cross-sectional study. These are the same folks who are either uh, living near those light rail stations now or folks that are farther away. Um, some preliminary data. This is the first time I've actually presented on some of our preliminary data. We hope in April to have this fully explicated in a, uh, a conference. Um, and we, but one of the first things we did was we wanted to see whether the walking that was near the light rail station actually changed from before the light rail to after. Um, so this pre is in 2008, before the stations opened. This is only our cases. These are only our cases that we're looking at here. And post is six months to a year after the light rail opened. One of the things we did is we went back to these folks the same time of year. And in fact, 90% of our sample, it's within two months of when they got their baseline data. That's the month we got their post one data. Folks that live between zero and a quarter mile um, from the station actually increase their walking near the light rail station. So within a, uh, a quarter mile of that light rail station, their amount of physical activity actually increased. Um, the folks that live a little bit farther away, not a lot of change. And folks that live even farther away from the station, not a lot of change. Now, perhaps surprisingly and unfortunately, um, their overall daily walking, independent of location, actually stayed the same in folks that lived nearer to the light rail stations, but actually decreased. Um, when they were farther away. Um, so we'll see whether that trend continues. Um, one of the things that is happening with the sample is it's getting older, right? And we saw from the original data that as you get older, you get less active. Um, I hope our conclusion isn't that light rail protects from declines in physical activity, but in fact might be the conclusion we come to uh, based on the three or four year data that we have. All right. Um, another study we're doing was we're, we're studying the impact of bus rapid transit, and we can argue whether this is rapid um, actually in our city or not. Um, our, our city now has six, or our county has six rapid uh, bus rapid transit lines. Um, four of them opened before we got to them, um, but two of them didn't. Um, so we're studying the impact of the E and the F line on the amount of physical activity folks are getting um, around those lines. Um, and we're encouraged by the increase in ridership. Uh, we see some from regular bus service along those lines um, to the BRT ridership service. Our, our service is actually meeting expectations um, in terms of increasing service. Um, with the exception of the, the service in, in Bellevue, um, which is not a place we should have put bus rapid transit. Um, so we're studying the ENF line. We're trying to understand more about um, the exposure of BRT um, and its impact on uh, transit use and physical activity. But in addition to infrastructure changes, we also have a, a social marketing campaign that our um, Metro Transit Authority is implementing called InMotion. 
So we're trying to understand the synergies between our in-motion program and the infrastructure change toward a bus driver transit system on transit use and ultimately physical activity. Um, if folks are familiar with InMotion, some of the things that they do, um, a lot of uh, flyers, a lot of invitations for folks to uh, join in motion and get incentives um, to actually engage in more transit behavior. You could sign up, you get rewards and incentives for doing uh, uh, non-motorized trips or at least uh, non-driving trips. So overall, I, I think we have strong associations and even better kind of research designs to suggest that public transportation is driving uh, people to be more physically active. I, I think soon we'll have more evidence about the shifts in public transportation infrastructure and whether that impacts and changes physical activity, which again is important, uh, particularly for policymakers who are making decisions about infrastructure and public health. Um, we still, um, I think, need more evidence about making the healthy choice the easy choice and perhaps trying to figure out how we can make public transportation a more easy choice for folks um, and the interactions between public transportation and programmatic interventions. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the example that I often use is the example that I have from um, my employer um, who tries to incentivize us not to drive. I don't know about PSU and what you know, we, incentives you guys get to not drive. Um, but there are a bunch of things that my employer does to try to encourage us to not drive to work. Um, one of them is we have bike cages um, inside our building to be able to um, lock our bikes up. Um, we have locker rooms in our buildings um, with towel service, a key critical component to uh, encourage you to drive. And we have free access to zip cars. So if I go to work by transit um, or by bike or by walking, um, I have available to me zip cars I can take um, to go to other meetings throughout our county and our city. <coughs> We're given, um, although this is changing this year, we're given free transit passes. Um, they feel like they've gone overboard with that. Now they're charging us a little bit of money for our transit passes. Um, folks are given free bikes if they're willing to commit to commute at least two times a week by bike. Um, we get free uh, tune-ups with a mobile bike service, and there's actually a uh, mobile bike service that opened just across the street from us. Um, he loves to see us, and we love to see him. Um, um, we also get paid not to drive to work. Um, so it's $4 a day in, in, in my paycheck if I don't drive to work. It's $12 cost to park if I do drive. Um, you know, I did the math one day. Uh, it's about a $25 to $26 differential um, per day for me to drive versus take transit. Um, and the time difference isn't monumental. Um, it's about a difference of 40 minutes overall. Um, and uh, uh, I'm likely impacting my health substantially by that choice that I make in the morning how I get to work. Um, one of the things from our uh, in motion uh, program that our metro is putting on, when you walk it, you rock it. Um, to acknowledge all the wonderful folks I get to work with, my research staff that collects all these data, other investigators um, at Seattle Children's as well as the, as the University of Washington. Um, I get to play with public health colleagues, which is just fantastic to see this stuff on the ground, doing implementation of policy and systems change, which is great, um, as well as um, our funders and other investigators at other institutions. Um, I think that's it. Thanks very much. Questions? I know I sh shrugged a question away, but did I answer it? I came back to it. Yeah. Okay, great. Other questions? Yeah. So uh, one thing that seems like your, your data set would be very useful for is also examining transit level of service and how that impacts uh, different behaviors and who's walking more for different types of level of service. And I'm wondering if there is potentially going to be components uh, of that in your, your research. There will be. There will be. Right? And, and so, you know, I, I, I'm always mindful when I tend to talk to folks that do transportation work that, that I, I, I'm not as savvy in all the things we could do with our data, um, but our transportation folks are very interested in level of service. Right, um, and how that impacts um, these relationships. Um, you know, the the um, I'm, I'm always surprised, um, at least local working with our local jurisdiction um, folks about um, how they don't see the link between transportation and health. Right, so they are they're, they're very focused on those things separately, but they don't see the overlap and link between them. Um, and I think as academics, we need to do a better job integrating those disciplines as well, right? clearly based on the data. Right? If you were to ask me, and I've, I was actually asked this at a, uh, an obesity conference a few years ago, you know, what would you do, uh, right? If you had uh, unlimited resources, you know, what would you do to get uh, people to be more active? Um, and I think the audience expected me to talk about programmatic stuff. I said uh, public transportation. Um, and I'd raise the cost of gasoline. 
um, to me, that would drive a real conversation about real public transportation um, and uh, the un, uh, untoward positive consequences of that would be physical activity. So, yeah. Um, I guess my question would be, for, I don't know if there's an answer for it, but see if you can approach for it. If, if the city of Portland uh, spends resources to make walking to transit easier, or, or TriMet spends resources to make walking to, to, to transit easier, and it, it makes people healthier, those residents are better off? The state, but the state of Oregon is better off? Monoma County, to extend the public health is better off? The federal government is better off? TriMet and the city of Portland don't really save any money. Yes. So, I mean, very, you know, very, right. very, very little savings of it. So, how do we convince yeah. those, the, those bodies that do save money to say, right. hey, instead of no. spending more That's directly right. on medical and That's right. doctors, That's right. that, yeah. why don't you just give TriMet a million bucks or give yeah. the city a million bucks of the sidewalk? Yeah, it's prioritization, right? It's prioritization. And, 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 and I don't think I don't have a good answer to that other than to continue to kind of provide evidence about this link. Um, and to, I mean, I, I think there, we, we, in healthcare, it's very hard to kind of line up payers um, and people who are suffering the consequences of that pay and, that, and not paying. Um, that said, I mean, I, again, I, I, I live in a city, you live in a city that's very progressive in this kind of thinking. Um, and I think we need to, as researchers, provide more evidence about, okay, what are the consequences of these things? And then determine costs as well, right? So one of the things we're doing with our BRT, and we're strongly encouraged to by um, health reviewers, which is great, is to actually do a cost-benefit analysis of that. So, okay, so BRT is a lot funded by federal uh, dollars, uh, federal transit, transit dollars. Um, let's look at the cost improvements, look at the cost benefits, and the, the negative consequences, perhaps, of transit um, on costs, um, and present to policymakers that information, right? So because a lot of them will say, yeah, those transit improvements will be great, but they cost so much money. Um, what's the health benefit of that? And or how can I take that back to constituents? And who else has to pay for it? Um, and you know, maybe it is um, idealistic of me to think that ultimately if we start to make those links, we'll actually bring health organizations and people that actually have to pay health care costs um, into the conversation. which was, um, it seems like uh, a major benefactor would be the employers, yeah. because they're the ones yeah. who are often um, yeah. paying for health care. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering if you'd seen any reports or even yeah. marketing yeah. that is targeting, instead of the transit users, but uh, targeting businesses and employers to say this is the um, potential savings right. per right. employee right. that you right. have if you get yeah. someone on the bus. No, that's a great question. I have not seen that. I mean, the, the last thing I, I ended with is, you know, this, I think we, what we have to do is understand the relationship or interaction between infrastructure and transportation level of service and programmatic interventions that are trying to get people out of their cars. And one of them could be work-based. Um, what I didn't say about my work is the reason we get incentivized to not drive has nothing to do with health. Um, it has everything to do with my institution sits, um, and I'm, I'm physically not at the main location, but the main location of our hospital is in a very wealthy part of town, and that community resists any expansion, right? So they do not want parking lots um, in their neighborhood, extra parking lots. Um, so uh, Seattle Children's is committed to having less than 30% of its staff commute to work by driving by 2030. That's a very aggressive goal. Um, the only way they're going to get it is by heavily incentivizing staff not to and disincentivizing driving. I mean, we have a very smart sustainability and transportation department, right? They escalate parking rates every single year. They use that money to subsidize the payment for not driving. Um, I don't, I've not seen good studies that have actually looked at that um, from a worksite perspective, right? And I've, I've asked our transportation folks, you guys need to document how much health savings you get because your folks are taking transit and walking to and from it. Um, because, and they actually, they, they self-insure. So they, they know exactly how much they're paying or not paying. Um, and I bet you they're saving a whole lot of money. They haven't done the math yet. They need to. Yeah. In this area, the higher income neighborhoods are the ones that are closer in yeah. and have access to yes. transit. And yes. um, it tends to be that the lower yeah. income neighborhoods are further out. 
Um, and while they're more reliant on transit, it doesn't serve them yeah, as well. Them as and well. so there's this right. really, right. you know, interesting tension between how, how do we get the service to the people who need it the right. most, and then how do we continue to incentivize the people who um, can afford to drive right. and pay for parking. Right. 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 No, I mean, exactly. I mean, we, and we have the exact same problem. Um, and in fact, it was uh, uh, last, gosh, Last August, we had a proposition on our ballot because our, our bus service and our bus agency is just losing money hand over fist. And actually, uh, the county as a whole voted against the proposition to raise more funds for them. Um, now, it turns out the economy improved and they didn't really need those funds, which is also damning for that agency. Um, but recently, uh, the city of Seattle decided to – the city of Seattle itself had a vote to try to supplement transit service within the city, and that passed. So you're going to get increasing inequities um, because you have more wealthy folks that are living in Seattle that are going to get better bus service. They're going to take transit. Their health is likely to improve as a result of that. It, yeah, it's a bad cycle, bad system. It's because the, the people who are incurring the costs, the medical care costs, aren't aligned and with the people who are doing yeah. – Nope, housing, the nope. Transit. that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Lots of problems with it. That said, um, and again, this is certainly not a panacea, and there's lots of problems with saying, well, we just have to increase transit and transit use. Um, that's a lot easier than saying you have to completely change your land use to increase densities, right? Um, but, yeah, a bunch of hands. Sorry, I'm not taking them in the right order, but go ahead. Um, do you have a sense among your transit users, um, how many of them are using this just for commuting, and how many of them are using it for other trips? That's a good question. Um, you know, we, we haven't looked at that in this sample. Um, and that would be a great question to ask, essentially a question to ask of our data. Um, and, yeah, we should know that. And we'll know, the we'll know the reasons why they took transit trips. If, in fact, they recorded in their diaries they took a transit trip and the activity codes for that. Um, so we could do that. And, I mean, the, the reality is, and, and again, I, I hesitate I hesitate sometimes to put that slide on the comparing the physical activity of this sample versus the U.S. as a whole. Um, if folks are familiar with where our transit line is, and it's in, it's in our lowest income area of Seattle, right? So it's not, it's not geographically representative even of our county. Um, so they had high transit use to start. About 40% of them were using bus before the light rail came in. Um, so they're high transit users. Um, and, you know, even if we see that, it, that their transit use is related to more activity, it may not be true of a place that has low transit use to start, right, um, and how you kind of transform that population to be more higher transit users. But we can look at why and how much was it work versus other. Yeah, it could be that the, uh, how much time they're spending on transit yeah. relative exactly. to Yeah, exactly, exactly, what, what they could have taken. Yeah, that's important to do. We're doing that in the BRT. Um, or, or would consider looking at streetcar specifically. Um, I guess I say it's kind of less commuter transit and more yeah. just of an, of an urban circular yeah. just functioning kind of different than yeah. BRT, LRT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, obviously this sample was selected specifically to be along the LRT. Um, we have to look at how many streetcar trips we saw. We didn't see a whole lot of them. Um, and again, I talked about walking and not biking. I, I realize that Portland is a very, very uh, positive biking experience. Um, we had very few bike trips. Um, and again, it could be the demographics, uh, uh, you know, at least the, de the demographics of our bikers in our city are more high income. They're not coming from the southern part of our city. They're more coming from the northern part of our city. We could look at streetcars. I, I just don't know how many streetcar trips we have um, and whether people are using those throughout their day. In your data, but that this discussion raises is, and it maybe gets back to the level of service question too. When I think of streetcar, I actually think the way it's designed, closer stops, yeah. that it could reduce the amount yeah. of walking because your stop yeah. is going to be closer as opposed to a light rail system. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about future uh, research, yeah. it will be interesting yes. to look at those trade offs and how you design your system. Mm -hmm. and there's other trade offs in operating that system. Yes. And Space stopping, etc. The same with buses. And, uh, just a yeah. comment for yeah. Future no, research. it's interesting. We we only have one streetcar so far. We have another one that's starting soon, which is in some sense a much better streetcar in that it it navigates up slopes that are hard to get up. Um, 
for a walking trip completely. Right. So like in downtown right. Portland, you right. can walk to right. the free street yeah. or if it's yeah, no. you. If you're a PSU employee, it's free to yeah. Uh, now yeah. I'm going to sit. Really, really, that's right. That's right. And that's a negative consequence of, of transit use, yeah. Um, I walk faster than our streetcar, so I never take our streetcar. Anyway. So, I mean, I assume a lot of folks that's true, particularly in a downtown corridor. Yeah. So, thanks. I, um, so, I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm like right here, there's a lot of people standing on it, and I say, well, my thinking is take the seats so there's more space, because sometimes I don't see where there's a free seat because there's too many standing mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. and they say, well, I'll sit all day, so I'll stand there. I'll stand there. So I don't know if that, but, and about the... Uh, we, we need, actually, we need to look at stand. I mean, the, there's a lot of, of conversation about, you know, the negative impacts of sitting. And again, I, as I described my work, I could sit all day. Um, thankfully, I have a standing desk that I can actually stand at. Um, but I, I wonder whether there's a difference in health. We can look, we can certainly use accelerometry and GPS data to look at standing and public transportation versus sitting um, and, and whether there's an impact on, on people's health with that. Hmm. Good question. Anecdotally, our accelerometer data, yeah. uh, which covers kids and adolescents yeah. and adults, uh, we did see that the adolescents actually were somewhat active on transit. On transit itself. I mean, it wasn't a huge. Yeah. It wasn't a huge number, so I'm not going to publish results on that. But I suspect <laughs> that yeah. is something. They're standing. It's great. question. Um, I, I don't know of any studies that has, that has looked at the impact of park and ride and, and whether people that use it get less physical activity as a result of their transportation. Um, I guess my only hope is that at least the terminal destination for them doesn't have a park and ride. Um, but my guess is that it, it directly correlates with or, or decreases their physical activity as a result of the park and ride. Um, we don't have any. We have one park and ride along our light rail system. Um, and you know we were we were working actually with a city that is getting the next stop um, in our system, um, and uh, they were doing a community engagement um, work around the design around that station. Um, and our transit agency a long time ago decided they were putting a garage there. Um, and I asked them, "Would you charge for your garage at all? Could you charge for your garage?" Um, they have always told us, "We're piloting that." Um, I mean, my, uh, the worry is not only that people are driving to it and they're not getting activity as a result of that, but it actually probably makes less positive the pedestrian experience around that for the people that don't have to drive to get there. Um, so, you know, if, if you had to make the decision of, oh, am I going to cross this really busy street where there's going to be 600 people trying to get into a parking lot at 7 a.m., um, you're probably not going to do that. So, two, un two untoward effects of park parking rides. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I really found your graph compelling with the transit users, non-transit users, and then the transit users with that additional 15 minutes of activity um, two days a week. That's a great slide. My question is, are you able in your field to quantify the benefits of that additional 15 minutes? Yeah, the additional 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, good question, um, in addition to those things. If, if it helps people get above that 30, there probably is a quantifiable benefit. Um, you know, I, I, I take the approach in, in part because of where we're, we're getting most people from of more is better, 
um, the, uh, the limit we had on our metric of physical activity was at least a five-minute bout. We didn't do 10 um, because there's a fair amount of debate about whether it needs to be 10 whole minutes continuous of, of, of physical activity. You know, I, I guess my reading of the, the data on physiologic benefit is if you're accumulating, you know, five to 10 minutes more each day, most days, there's going to be a physiologic benefit to that. I mean, probably even independent of weight loss, right? So that's not probably sufficient to, for example, if you're trying to lose, that's not going to do it. You're not going to lose weight by walking to and from transit and doing that. Um, but if it's uh, accumulated, you're having cardiovascular benefits from that amount. I, mean, I always think about it as a programmatic side, like yeah. the fact that you're really into going to work and then kept yeah. in, you know, like. The emotion stuff. Yeah, like. That extra 15 minutes will result yeah. in Yeah, but you can make that. Okay, we're going to have to bring to an end. We're at 1 o'clock. I will uh, make a note next Friday. We have Jordan Palmieri from Oregon DEQ talking about accessory dwelling units, uh, which have transportation implications for parking. Thank you very much, Dr. Salins. Thank you.